Hey guys, today's episode, the inspiring story of Jonathan Franklin is presented by our friends at Compassion International, releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. Check out fillthestadium.com to learn how you can help partner with Compassion and our pro athlete friends to release 70,000 kids and their families who are in Compassion programs from poverty. You can donate and help these children and their families through the next critical few months. Every donation helps fill a seat toward a year of needed funding. This is a stadium that cannot remain empty. Help us restore what COVID-19 destroyed and donate today at fillthestadium.com. Welcome to Sports Spectrum, where we bring Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, former ESPN producer, Jason Romano. And welcome everyone to Sports Spectrum. I am Jason Romano. So glad you're tuning into the show today. You can follow along with us on social media, on Twitter and Instagram at sports underscore spectrum. And you can find us at our website, sportspectrum.com. That's where all of our content can be found. And it's all for free right there at the website. Podcasts, devotionals, stories, conversations, articles, all available for free on the intersection of sports and faith at sportspectrum.com. Dot com. And when you're at our website, click that newsletter icon at the top, and it gives you an opportunity to put your email address in and sign up for our Sports Spectrum Weekly Newsletter. Every Wednesday morning, you will get an email from us updating you on all of the stories and the articles that you may have missed throughout the week here at Sports Spectrum. We're, we're releasing a lot of content, and we're writing a lot of content and a lot of stories, and we want to share them with you. We don't want you to miss them because they're all important importing people back to Christ. So signing up for Sports Spectrum Weekly is a great way to stay in touch with all that we have going on. And when you sign up, we have a free gift for you, a 10-day daily devotional written by professional athletes to help you in your journey with God. And it is for free. All you got to do is put your email address in and sign up for Sports Spectrum's weekly newsletter, and you are good to go. And you'll get that 10-day daily devotional for free right there at Sports Spectrum. Com. So sign up today. And man, we have one encouraging and inspiring conversation today with Jonathan Franklin. His current role is with the Los Angeles Rams. He's the director of social justice and football development. But Jonathan has had quite the journey to bring him to where he is with the Rams. And that journey continues as he's actually studying for his bachelor's in theology. Jonathan's had quite the turn here. This is a guy who went to college at UCLA, was a first-team All-American his senior year. He's the all-time leading rusher in UCLA Bruins history, over 4,400 rushing yards. He had 1,700 yards rushing and 13 touchdowns in his senior year of 2012. Jonathan goes on and gets selected in the fourth round of the 2013 NFL Draft by the Green Bay Packers. Yes, those Green Bay Packers with Aaron Rodgers and company. Jonathan comes in and he plays okay, has a couple of fumbles. He ends up getting benched. And then he gets an opportunity in week 12 of his rookie year against the Minnesota Vikings. And that would be the last game that Jonathan Franklin would ever play in the NFL. He shares that story and how his relationship with God has really evolved over the years. But really, he's found his true purpose in his walk with Christ since week 12 of his rookie year in 2013. This is one encouraging story with Jonathan Franklin from the Los Angeles Rams. Let's take a listen now to this conversation with Jonathan. Hey Jonathan, welcome to the show. Hey Jason, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here with you. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here uh, with us. You have such a unique role as the director of football development and social justice with the Rams, you also have a very um, interesting story. We'll say ups and downs and all arounds and God at the center of it all. So love to hear about that. But first, let's hear about the Rams position that you have director of football development and social justice. It feels like it's two roles. I could be wrong here, uh, but tell us what that role entails. Yeah, correct. So when, when you think about the, the aspect of social justice is finding access. You know, when you, and, and really 
uh, a heavy focus from, from the youth aspect as well, from youth justice too. So when you think about correctional facilities, nonprofits, youth in high school, character education, mental health, uh, law enforcement, right? Really finding ways to, to build a bridge to link the law enforcement with the communities, really finding creative ways. And that's where the football development piece come in because it's the power of football, right? It's the power of football that cr can create change, that can provide hope where it doesn't exist and maintain it where it does, right? So really, I'm thinking outside the box and, and being able to unite communities, um, listen, learn, and respond uh, based off the communities that we serve in, even throughout throughout the year. You know, when um, every summer we head down to, to Irvine or Orange County uh, for training camp, about 30 miles away, we play in Inglewood at, at SoFi Stadium, another 30 miles north. We're out in Thousand Oaks, Agora Hills um, for just, that's where our headquarters are. So, you know, we have different footprints, you know, throughout the communities, every, every community that we're in, there's a different array of issues, right? So really listening, learning, and responding to those from a, the lenses of social justice but also using the power of football to address those needs and those, those issues. Is that travel in Los Angeles still, still bad right now? Is it, is it, is it getting a little better? I mean, we're still in the middle of this pandemic. Is it, is it, is it still a nightmare to get on the road and drive around in LA? You know, it's funny, Jason, I was having a conversation with a friend a few days ago and I was like, you know, how's your drive today? And um, they were like, you know, it's about an hour. It wasn't bad. I'm like, Whoa, the fact <laughs> that we say, uh, our drive isn't bad. Something's wrong here, you know. So it, it, it's relative. Who knows? It's subjective, I would say. Um, I guess. I mean, an hour drive. drive to me is is a long ways. That's a long right. drive. <laughs> but it, our drive is a good thing for us here in Los Angeles, which I can't believe we accepted that standard. But that's how it is right now. So who know. knows if it's getting better? I know it's a different world. <laughs> it's interesting too to think about your journey because you're 31. Um, soon to be 32 in October, probably thinking if I was talking to 16 year old Jonathan Franklin and I said, you're going to be 32 and you're going to be with the Rams. You would have said, yep, I'll buy that. I'm with the Rams. I'm going to be playing for my hometown team in Los Angeles, but it's a different perspective. Obviously when, when we make plans, God kind of laughs, that's the saying, um, and your journey has been an interesting one. So take me through a little bit of that journey because you are a born and bred LA guy, right? Born, yeah, to your point, born and bred. I'm, I'm an L.A. native. I uh, grew up in South L.A., South Central L.A. a few years ago, but we don't say that anymore, I guess. Right. But uh, attended Dorsey High School and um, was very grateful to have both parents in my life. Um, grew up about 10, 15 minutes from each other. They were separated, but extremely very influential. Um, my mom was a hardworking mom and um, definitely brought just great men you know, even women in my life as mentors and really allowed me to see the, the bigger picture of life, of perspective um, in different areas. And at an early age, started to play football, maybe in, a, in the fifth grade. And, and that was kind of um, turned out to be more than just a game, you know, as my life kind of took off uh, down the road. But yeah, born and raised in, in, in South Los Angeles. All right. So rank these three things for 16-year-old Jonathan Franklin. Faith, football, family. Rank wow. those three things when you're talking about the teenager <laughs> who is probably coming into his own as a high school football player. Definitely. I would say family, football, faith. Okay. Absolutely. Where was faith? It's, it was third on that spectrum for you. Was it prevalent at all as you were a kid growing up? A, a little bit. You know, my, you know we, my mom and I went to church, you know, growing up. And, and early, maybe 10 and 10 and under, you know, it was kind of like, hey, you have to go. <laughs> and then after between maybe I say 11 and 16, 17, it was pretty kind of my choice to attend. And, and I would go here and there. My mom would, would share scriptures, but it wasn't something that I was really pursuing heavily. Um, it was just something in the background that was like, hey, I feel like I have to do because it's talked about a lot. Right. Um, it was more familiarity rather than a connection to it. So faith wasn't really as prevalent for me um at that age when did it come prevalent when did when did when did the the, the the switch click right and you were like ah okay yeah this is important and i need to make this a faith that's my own when did that happen i would say you know the seeds were planted um and watered why god did the building over time the seeds were planted maybe my the summer leading into my senior year at UCLA. So once I left Dorsey High School, was blessed to 
be a student athlete and, and attend UCLA and um, still kind of live my own lifestyle and accredit it to a lot of my success to, to my very own self. So even didn't really seek, the, seek God, right? As if I needed God, right? Because mm -hmm. of so many things were going so well from my perspective of what I thought well was. And then the summer leading into my senior year, um, the best, uh, one of my best friends, my best friend, uh, I was now I was walking into a, a bank, a credit union, and he pretty much was like, hey, what's up? You know, he's like, hey, what's up, Frank? He starts, we start having a conversation. And after the conversation, he's like, hey, man, what's your number? Gave it to him. And then the next day, he asked me to meet on these steps. And he starts talking about God. I'm like, <laughs> Jesus, I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, and I've heard about God, but like the way he was speaking about this peace that he has because of God and Jesus, this joy, this purpose. I'm like, yo, this is a different um, lenses as I'm seeing this God in Jesus, Jesus as, right? Um, it was more so for me growing up, this genie, right? I go to God, Jesus, when I needed something, right? Or things are going well, I'll come back to you later when they're not. But he was just talking about this God, Jesus, that's more so of a lifestyle. I'm like, whoa, hmm. what is this? Um, and he was a gentleman, he worked at UCLA, he was a custodian there. Um, and I was like, wow, you know, you're speaking to me. You have the boldness, right? I'm doing well in football. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in this, in my mindset, thinking that I'm bigger than I am, right? Just because of the, you know, just the, the flesh in me. But he came to me and really start talking about Jesus and God. I'm like, wow, this is something I want to learn more about. And I used to meet him at those steps and he just talked about God. And for the first time, read the Bible, you know, you taught me like, you know, how to really break down verses and pray and start inviting my teammates out to just pray randomly throughout the day at school and read the Bible. And I'm like, wow, that was kind of when the seeds were planted um, hmm. with God. So you say the seeds were planted, um, but we still have to make that decision or we still have to kind of chase after God because it's easy to become kind of complacent or even drift a little bit. And by the way, your senior year at UCLA was pretty darn good, right? 1,700 <laughs> yards, 13 touchdowns. You go on to be an NFL draft pick, and we'll talk about the NFL side of things in a second. You're the all-time leading rusher in UCLA history. So you have these amazing experiences on the field. What was that senior year like for you after you have this encounter, if you will, with God and trying to pursue him? Because you're also, like I said, having you know one of the best seasons ever for a UCLA running back. It was, it, it was great, you know, uh, to your point, you know, super blessed to leave UCLA, become the all-time leading rusher, breaking four records there. It was uh, the, the, the breakout year, you know, but, yeah. but that season, you know, it was a lot of hard work, you know, as well. Every Monday morning, I was up at 5 a.m. running. Uh, we had a stadium and then we had practice at seven and working out Tuesday, Wednesdays in the evening, going swimming. So there was a lot of work, a lot of hard work that I put in, but also there was a change in, in my choices, um, especially as far as my, my, my best friend, his name's Keenan, when we start connecting, you know, I wasn't, I didn't party at all that, that year. Uh, a lot of, there was a lot of changes in my lifestyle from drinking, from drugs, from even celibacy that yeah. uh, was, was living out. I'm like, man, I, I need to make these changes in my life. And I had friends in my circle that we held each other accountable. Um, if someone were to engage us, right, from the opposite sex, or um, if one of us was tempted to go out, we made sure we was living on this path that we kind of committed to, right, based off our goals, but based off also spiritually the examples that we want to live. Um, and we want to be able to call people to imitate us as well. So I was grateful to have those changes. It was extremely uncomfortable <laughs> to, to, to be in that place. And yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. A lot of my teammates didn't agree with it. Me not participating in certain things and got clowned and all those stuff, which it's all good. Um, but uh, there were, there was just some decisions I had to make. There were some sacrifices. There were some moments of uncomfort I had to live in to really, I think, produce the fruit or produce the outcomes of what happened my senior year. Uh, but also um, was able to to pray, you know, when we travel, you know, for over team during the team meals after practice. So really, the the boldness uh, for God really grew as because prior to that, I was I was afraid, you know, to talk about God in public. You know, many times the Bible can be very intimidating. Yeah. Um. But yet to be able to bring my teammates in and 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 simplify the Bible in a sense more so like 
introduce it to them in a loving way, um, in a gentle way, um, was really encouraging throughout that year. And even after every game, it was I was on the bus reading the Bible, I was praying. Um, so, so living for God became for me that senior year lifestyle rather than just a hobby that I picked up and put down when I wanted to. The polar opposite of Los Angeles, California is Green Bay, Wisconsin. <laughs> and uh, you get selected by the Packers, fourth round, 2013 NFL draft. Um, I have to imagine that first visit to Green Bay, it's kind of like Dorothy, right? You don't, we're not in Kansas anymore here. This is a different world. What was that like for you adjusting to the NFL world, especially in a place like Green Bay, where there's so much tradition, but at the same time, it's a different, like I said, a different animal than, than growing up and living in Los Angeles. You, you hit it on a nail, right? I, I'm growing up in Los Angeles. It is 80 degrees, 365 days a year. It never snows out here. We have Beverly Hills, right? We have the flashy life. Um, Los Angeles is just a different, different world. And go to Green Bay, right? When you have your four seasons, you know, it's 10 degrees. Um, you, yeah. you, you're seeing deer in your backyard and rabbits, you know? I'm like, yo, what is this? Yeah. You know? Um, so it was a complete culture shock. Absolutely. You know, you, you grew up in Los Angeles with every kind of type of food that you can think of. In Green Bay, you got some cheese curds, you know, or, you know, you got to select two restaurants. But, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, as I look back, you know, I love, love the Midwest. I really do. The, the genuineness, the authenticity of the people. I mean, for me, experiencing the seasons for the first time, having a, 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 snow, a white Christmas, you know, snowing on Christmas and, yeah. you know, around Thanksgiving and, and introduced to so many different things. Um, there was a piece about it, but also to, from, to your point about the, the football aspect, it was, um, it was a, uh, a, a new world as well. You know, you, you go to college where it's this kind of this closeness, you know, there's kind of um, a stability, right? You have four years, you're going to be there, you're building with your teammates, you're seeing them all the time, you're growing with them, going to class, to the NFL, and like, hey, you might not be there next week. Right. This is now a business, right? These are your colleagues um, who you work with, you know, so there's a different perspective and, and a maturity that's required, you know, to sustain on that level. There's a different balance that's necessary, right? Financially, even from the mental, emotional, a wellness of it um, with friendships, relationships, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a new, new awareness, right? That um, you're called to have being in the NFL and, and, and being successful there and remaining there for a long period of time, which for me, it was a surprise. Absolutely. Let's take a quick break from our sports spectrum podcast conversation to tell you a little bit more about our partners and sponsors Compassion International, the most trusted child development ministry in the world. Compassion is about releasing kids from poverty in Jesus' name. And over the last year and a half, it's been a very tough go for all of us during this pandemic. But due to COVID-19, 70,000 kids and their families in Compassion programs have been left in dire, dire situations, and they need our urgent support. 70,000 is also the capacity of an average pro football stadium. And so here's what's happening. Compassion has partnered with our pro athlete friends to help fill the stadium, to fill a stadium worth of children in need, 70,000 kids in need. Now you can go to fillthestadium.com right now to learn more and to donate and help these kids and their families during these critical next few months. Every donation helps fill a seat toward a year of needed support, talking about things like essential food, nutritional supplements, hygiene solutions, and medical screenings for COVID-19. Think about that. You can make this difference right now in a kid and their family's life by donating through Compassion at fillthestadium.com. And so far, we've filled over 60,000 seats our goal is to help 70,000 kids, and you and I can partner right now with Compassion and make that a reality. Go to fillthestadium.com to learn more and donate today. Fillthestadium.com. Jonathan Franklin's our guest here. We're so glad to have the former NFL and UCLA standout running back joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. 
Uh, in life, there is a saying, as I mentioned earlier, when we make our own plans, uh, God laughs. And I know your plan was probably, like I said, to play football for many, many years, even maybe to 2021, being with an NFL team in your early 30s. But that didn't happen. Um, week 12 of your rookie year, you suffer a neck injury and you never play again. Can you kind of take me back to that game? Uh, you're 23 years old. You're in the latter stages of your rookie year, just trying to figure it out in the NFL, and you're facing the Minnesota Vikings. Tell us what happened. Right, and, and, and it's so interesting, right, that th this moment that we're about to build to because I leave UCLA, all-time leading rusher. I'm drafted by the Packers. This is my lifelong dream. I made it. I remember week three of, the, uh, of our season, we're playing the Cincinnati Bengals, and I'm able to have a, a good game, right? I run for 100 yards, although I fumble at the end. The mm. next game, I fumble, and, and I'm kind of benched, right? Don't really play too much. And week 12 was the opportunity. Yeah, I'm starting at kick returner. So, hey, I'm like, this is the moment where I can prove myself again, and I can reestablish that Jonathan belongs in the NFL. Yeah. So I'm excited. Um, so first play of the game, first quarter, ball is kicked. I catch it. I'm running 5'10", and I get hit on the crown of my helmet. As I go down, I fumble the ball. And I remember laying on the ground, and I'm looking at the ball. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I need to pick this thing up. I just fumbled. It's so the first play of the game. This is all bad. And as I try to go pick up the ball, I realize I cannot move at all from my neck down. I'm mm -hmm. literally, for, for a few moments, just there, motionless. Um, and after... And maybe a minute or less, minute and a half, I'm able to get my feelings back, jog to the sideline. But the doctor was just like, hey, are you, are you okay? Um, they sent me into the locker room. As I'm walking to the locker room, I look back, and little did I know, I'll be my last time ever in a Green Bay Packers uniform um, on Lambeau Field as a player. I was forced to medically retire uh, due to a spinal contusion, maybe about a year later. And, and, and the story, Jason, is so crazy because I, I get injured. We think it's a concussion and I'm just going to be out that week. And uh, the following week, I, I, I get another MRI. We see a spot on my spine. It's like, oh, let's wait. So we waited and end up being on injury reserve. The season ends and there's no decision to retire yet. Right. It's like, hey, go home, train. <laughs> yeah. So I go home and train and, and get in the best shape of my life. And I come back for OTAs and I'm ready to play year two not knowing what's going to happen. Um, so eventually get an MRI, visit a few doctors, and that's where I first hear, you probably won't be able to play football again from four different doctors. I remember yeah. it was our last day in OTAs. Um, I was traveling uh, to Los Angeles to uh, um, visit family, and actually my brother was coming back to me. He was planning to come back to me to Green Bay to spend some time, and that doctor just called me in. and was like, hey, um, unfortunately, we won't be able to clear you. Um, to play, uh, we'll be releasing you today and you, you have to medically retire. Hmm. Um, and man, that was the most, at that time, most painful moment in my life. Yeah, you're 24, 23, and you hear that and you put so much into this journey, even training for that season, because I'm guessing when you suffered that injury, you didn't know immediately that that would be your last time Right. You ever played in a football game, right? Right. No, not at all. You know, I absolutely thought I would I would come back, you know, especially slowly, you know, building my faith. I'm like, all right, God, you just got me in this moment. You're testing me. I'm going to be good. You know, I'm going to be this story that's going to inspire so many people, right? Yeah. Because uh, I bounced back, but it didn't happen. You know, even when I, the, the first doctor told me like, hey, you're, you're never going to play football again. I was, I looked at him like, what? Not at all. Heart super hard. And the second doctor, the second doctor, he told me the same thing. Not at all did I believe him when he told me the words, you will never play football again. Um, hmm. Especially training so hard, you know, like I've never done before. I was like, this is my year. I'm, I'm going to show so everyone I belong. And, and to receive that news, it was, it was devastating. Describe the emotions um, that you went through in your relationship with, with Christ in accepting and maybe it took a long time, but in, in accepting that football, playing football wasn't going to happen anymore. Yeah, it, it was tough. It, it, it really was tough. And I'm grateful now that <laughs> I'm able to express this because vulnerability was such an uncomfortable, unfamiliar thing for me at that time. So 
Sure. To be honest, it was not something that I did accept. It wasn't something I, I turned to God to. But ra- rather than football, for me, it was my identity. You know, even working out, every time I worked out, it was only for football. It wasn't for my health. <laughs> it was for football to play. So um, going out, right? I'm not talked to as, hey, Jonathan, how's life? Hey, Jonathan, you went to UCLA, you played for the Packers, you know, like, so this identity, every room I walked into was never Jonathan as a person. It was Jonathan as a football player. Um, my family, right? I, I was able to inspire, give them hope, dreams because of football. And that, for, and this, this was my, 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 how I was thinking. So when this game is taken away, it's like, how do I even operate? How do I converse? How can I walk in a room and be confident? How can I be me when I don't even know who, who I am? So there was this process of my whole entire world being shooken up and everything in that moment for me being taken away. And I really had to create Jonathan. And it took, I would say, maybe two years Mm. to really accept, right? Because I filled the void of football with partying, with with going out, with with, with engaging in so many different things to just feel this. The, the, this void that I, that I had that, that was created to, to find these temporary moments of satisfaction and happiness and peace because I didn't know how to give it to me because football was gone. And I realized, actually, although I thought I was seeking God when I was talking to my friends, I was, again, just kind of using God as this placeholder to do really well in football, mm-hmm. you know. And, and so my heart, I realized, whoa, I wasn't really connected as I thought I was. You know, because this injury, I wasn't going to God. I was going to everything else but God at that time. And um, it was a tough time for me. It really was um, emotionally, mentally, spiritually as well. To re- because there was so much in my heart that was truly being revealed that I didn't like. But I knew f- for me to ever change, for ever, me to ever be transformed, I would have to accept the truth that I did not like about me at that time with who I was. And the truth that people were able to see about me as well. And some for the first time. Do you know who uh, Inky Johnson is? Are are you familiar with Inky? So his story is similar to yours, except his happened in college where he had an injury and he could never play sports again. In fact, I think he lost the use of his, I believe it's his right arm. I'm not sure if it was his left or his right arm. And he shared his story here on Sports Spectrum. But it made me think, at what point do you discover your true purpose? Right. And you going through what you had to go through and understanding that your story, Jonathan, and I hope people who are listening right now understand that this is this went this this happened for a reason for you to be able to glorify God and for you to be able to inspire others. That's what Inky's doing. I know that's what you're doing as well. When did you discover that though? You said it was a two year process, but at what point do you finally understand or come to the realization that God was was still here with you and allowing you to go through this so that you could inspire others. Right. And it was gradually right of, of different layers being removed. And, you know, I, I love Paul, you know, the apostle Paul Yeah. and his life, right. Of, of being stoned, right. Of being hated, of being shipwrecked. Um, and, and just all the hardships that he had to endure. And Paul always boasts about his weakness for God's glory. You know, he always shares about how he had to go through these things, even for his salvation. And having the right people in my life, right? And, and I'm so grateful for, for the men um, and the women God has placed in my life because I had to understand that this moment of football for me, as I realized that it wasn't to destroy me, <laughs> It wasn't to necessarily disrupt my entire life, but I, I believe and I'm grateful for that the worst moment became the best possible thing that happened to me. But that football being taken away very well could have been for my just my own salvation hmm. and not idolizing football, not idolizing fo- people, not idolizing myself, but truly allowing God to be God um, hmm. and living this life of obedience. And allowing my peace, my joy, my comfort to come to God and God alone. And I was never there in football, ever. God was a genie. God was a God that I went to when I needed something, right? Or when things weren't going well, but it was never truly, truly a lifestyle 
that regardless of what's going on, where I'm at, that I'm solely focused on heaven and bringing other people along the way. And I'm just living for you, God, regardless of what the world looks like, you know? And I think just really um, studying out the Bible um, with men in my life and really seeing it for the truths of, of what it was helped me understand that. I think at that two-year process, and I was, you know, I spoke with therapists and I had people, you know, in my life and I cried and, and, and start journaling. And I did so many things, but it just came a moment where I was just like, man, this is where I am. This is who I am. And, and although my, my life at this moment has not produced the outcome that I envisioned it, envisioned yeah. it to, sure. um, I can still create a new version of me and yet perhaps a better version of me. And this was what needed to happen to get to that point. You know, um, sometimes for me, I'm learning that I need to be broken to truly be healed, right? Maybe I need to be bruised, right? To even be standing before the cross, to even be forgiven, to realize where I stand before God. You know, so I think it was all these things I had to accept and, 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 and realize to know who I was before God, but like also who I was before the path I wanted to create in my life as well. Have you, uh, have you been back to Green Bay since that injury? I have. So after the injury, I was able to intern uh, with the Packers. So okay. why I think that the, the healing process took so long, because even being injured, I came back and worked for the organ organization. But yet I would go in the locker room, right? I would see someone else, you know, name at my locker. I would be on the field. I would be interviewing players, you know, when they were going to their meeting rooms. I was going upstairs to the office, right? I had to park in a different parking lot and seeing there. So were all these things I had to face and I still wanted that and it was there, but I knew I could never get it. Yeah. So it was the, the reality that I was like, whoa, I was still living in, wanting something so close to it, but no, you can never get it again. And so it was the emotional just pain every day that I had to, to face during that time. I think that's kind of stretched out the healing process. But, it, but, you know, it's crazy because I needed that. It, I look back and I see, see the, the growth I was able to have because of these, these moments. And, and don't get me wrong, I would have loved to still be playing football. Of course. I would have loved to still be out there, right? But yet as I look back, what a blessing it has been for me to see a side of me and create a version of Jonathan that I've never been able to do, even through football to connect emotionally, mentally, spiritually, to, to be able to overcome the test and see like, whoa, this is actually a refinement, right? This is a renewal. This is a growth. Um, so I, I, I've been grateful for the moments. They were very uncomfortable, but I'm learning more and more the beauty and the power of uncomfort for me um, in various situations of my life. Yeah. And it probably helped you discover this uh, new purpose, if you will, working in football. You started with Notre Dame uh, and you worked in student development. I also read you led some student athlete uh, Bible studies, which is great. Um, so God is clearly working in your life at your time in Notre Dame. And then you come to the Rams and now you're, as we mentioned at the top, the director of social justice and football development with the Los Angeles Rams. So there's like this newfound purpose for you, it appears, to really help make a difference in people's lives. Absolutely. You know, and, and many times, right. You know, I think about, and I just started a garden. So I'm in this kind of, I'm a fanatic about <laughs> plants and I love all it. these yeah. things, right. But th there's such a uh, connection to life, you know, and the seed, it always has its purpose, but unfortunately I haven't had the best start <laughs> with certain <laughs> herbs that I planted. You haven't reaped learned, the harvest yet, Jonathan. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right. But on the, the importance of the soil yeah. right, that is placed in yes. and the seed, it doesn't mean that it, it's not meant to grow, but it has to be placed in the right soil, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I'm learning, like, I've always had purpose, but was I in the right soil to truly grow, right? Was the, were there the right people pouring into my life or was I putting myself in a position for me to just personally pour into me as well, you know? So Right now, I'm, I'm learning more and more about, man, the environment of what I allow into my life is truly going to help me produce the, the heart, reap the harvest, right? Or, or really live in the purpose that I'm called to, right? And I'm thankful for God placing me sometimes in these environments of uncomfort, right? Of, of refinement, of sometimes maybe success to even still see what's in my heart, you know? 
Am I going to give it to God or give it to Jonathan? So I'm learning more and more. The environments are truly a call to allow me to produce my true purpose, right? But it's now having that perspective every moment along the way. Man, that's so well said. Um, What's discipleship look like for you today, right? Who pours into you? How do you stay connected? And you're in LA and, you know, I'm here in Connecticut and we're still walking through this pandemic. The last year and a half has been so hard for so many, so much pain, not just from the pandemic, from all the other things that have gone on with the racial unrest and the political divide and everything else. Um, But for you, how do you stay discipled? How do you stay connected to to that bind, as I say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So in 2018, I actually got baptized, which I was grateful for, studied the Bible, was made into a disciple, um, got baptized. And then maybe a year ago, I started ministry school, um, internationally, International Christian School of Ministry, um, okay. so it's a two-year program. Um, then I'll get my bachelor's in theology. But w- w- what helps me just being in a disciple relationship, you know, I think Matthew 28, um, verse 19, right after you baptize a disciple, it says, teach them to be obedient, right? So really having people in my life teaching me to be, be obedient, being discipled every day, weekly, right? Being open about where I'm at to remain in the light, right? To have true fellowship with disciples. Um, and I think what it means to me is, is a life of obedience. You know, uh, you know, I was reading a few weeks ago in, in 1 John 5, 3, talks about love, right? And uh, it, and it says to love God is to obey God, you know? And then Romans 8, 28, which is talked about a lot is those who love, you know, all things works out for those who love God, you mm-hmm. know? And I'm like, whoa, I've never really put the connection is like things are going to work out for me, not just because I know God, but because I love God. Right. But loving God is to be obedient, you know? So when we think about discipleship, what it looks like, it's a life of obedience. Um, It's a living according to the Bible, not my emotions, right. Not according to my flesh. Right. Cause I can be, it can be, my heart is deceitful. So it's really every day consistently aligning my life with what the Bible says. And it's extremely uncomfortable and it is some suffering (laughs) in the midst of living based off the bible um but i you know that's what i'm called to do if i truly love god right my expression to god based off my love is my obedience my holiness my blamelessness my purity Mm. so that's the place that i'm calling to 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 remain in it is not easy um and it's out there bearing fruit you know working to truly make disciples share my faith daily you know it's and not just by necessarily Posting something, right? Um, which, you know, I, I, I definitely love to share my faith, you know, through those, those rounds. But even in a grocery store, you know, conversing about God, asking people to come out and, and dive into the word and, and seek God. Because ultimately, I'm realizing that I'm not called to just build here on earth, but I actually build in heaven, right? Mm-hmm. And helping people along the way and having a peer perspective of like there's a heaven and a hell, which is not talked about enough, but it's so true. Oh, yeah. And there's people in the past, right? One or the other. And it's my goal to help bring more disciples to the kingdom of heaven. So that's kind of my focus, right? How can I expand God's kingdom, right? How can I live this life of obedience, working wholeheartedly for God and not for Jonathan? You know, so Mm. every day there's this battle for me against the devil, the flesh, and the world, right? And I got God with me to win and conquer this battle and just remain holy and pure. Um, in like 20 years, uh, is Jonathan Franklin going to be a pastor because this bachelor's <laughs> theology could turn into a master's or a PhD. I mean, you never know, but is Ooh. this something, this ministry world and, and listen, people can work in, you know, a forum like the NFL and still be in ministry. I mean, a lot, of, I know a lot of people who've done that, uh, coach Tony Dungy comes to mind, right. As a guy who's just, he looks at his life as ministry and yet he still works in, in an NFL nice. space. Um, do you see that maybe like 20 years down the road when you're in your early fifties or something thinking mm-hmm. maybe, maybe God's calling me into ministry. W- would that be something that wouldn't surprise you, Jonathan? I would definitely be open to it. Yeah. You know, uh, I really would, you know, that would, that would be a blessing to serve in that capacity. Right. Um, although the people are the church, but to really be able to, to, you know, lead um, God's people. Right. And, and to, you know, really go out there and, and, make the gospel attractive, right? To, to expand the kingdom as well. well. We'll love that. You know, if God calls me that, that direction, I'm open. And it's a scary thing <laughs> to be like, hey, God, That's right. I'm open to what you want, right? Because we, who know, we don't really know the thoughts of God, right? So it can be like, 
sometimes nerve wracking, but yet a, a place of faith, right, that I'm living in, um, which is good. Um, and being yeah. willing to go if God calls me to go, right? So we'll see, you know, potentially there can be an opportunity down the road to, to lead in that capacity. Yeah. Open hands and open arms, right? Your will be Absolutely. done. So it's like, mm -hmm. okay, God, put it in your hands and you just direct our paths. So <laughs> you got a great path, Jonathan Franklin, ahead of you for sure. But your story is really an important one. I'm glad that you were able to share it here. And I'm glad that everybody listening hopefully was inspired like I was to, to hear your journey. So thanks for being here, brother. All the best to you. And uh, hopefully we'll get you back on sometime. Thanks. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. And many thanks to Jonathan Franklin from the Los Angeles Rams for joining us here today on Sports Spectrum. What a story this young man has. And getting baptized in 2018 and now going for his bachelor's in theology and the work that he's doing with the Rams. Talk about finding a true purpose in life. When you think you're supposed to be a football player and God says, I have other plans for you, Jonathan, and they're good. And man, he's living out that purpose right now, doing great things with the Rams and telling his story like he shared today on Sports Spectrum, man, that was just so encouraging to me. It really was. And just thank Jonathan for being here today on Sports Spectrum. We also thank you for listening as well. We hope you were encouraged by this conversation. If this is something that you think somebody else needs to hear, somebody who's gone through a dark time, somebody who's looking for new purpose in their life, maybe struggling with their identity in who they are, man, share this podcast, share this conversation with someone the conversation that we just had with Jonathan Franklin. Let them know that you heard this story right here on Sports Spectrum and use us as a resource to be able to tell people about Jesus. And by sharing it, it helps spread the gospel. That's our goal is to point people to Christ. And hopefully as you listen to this, you'll see this conversation as a way to share with someone else as well. So do that. And again, rate, review, subscribe. That helps get the word out on Sports Spectrum, telling others about our podcast and about the ministry that we have here. Check out our website, sportsspectrum.com, each and every day for new content. And join us next time right here on the show. Have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, and we'll see you soon.